Before I start, I do want to put a couple of plugs in. One for Wednesday night. If you're a recovering prayer wimp or you feel like you're a prayer wimp, our Wednesday night Bible study, the chances leading, it is terrific. Based on a Max Potato study, and basically it just starts by saying, God, you are good. I need your help. They need your help. Amen. You know, like Max says, you know, there are some people that just stand up and they open their mouth and just prayer just rolls out. And then there are those of us who, who pray and, and, and we say words and we're not quite sure what to say. But I think as long as we remember, God, you are good. I need your help. They need your help. Amen. We'll be okay. And we also, this morning, started a new Sunday school lesson called The Promises of God. And it's actually the promise of God, as shown through Scripture, that we do have an eternal future. And so that just started this morning. So I would invite you to join us at 9.30 on Sunday. I know it may have to set your alarm clock a little bit earlier, but sometimes it, it's worth it if you're getting fed. If you were here with us last week, you may remember that our gospel lesson found Jesus confronting the Jewish religious elite, the scriptural authorities of the day, the Pharisees and the scribes who were standing back on their high horse with their arms crossed, tisking and tasking and humping about the disciples eating with unwashed hands. And they were just saying, well, Jesus, why are you allowing these men to eat with unwashed hands? Don't you know what our traditions are? Don't you know how the right way to worship is and what's good and what's bad and here you are, standing in the middle of all these sinners, allowing your disciples to be just like them and not wash their hands before they eat. Well, Jesus made it quite clear that eating with unwashed hands and not following man-made traditions is not what makes someone unclean in the eyes of God. He says what defiles is not man-made tradition. It is not man-made law. It is not unclean hands. It's not anything on the outside that makes someone unclean. But it is the human heart. <coughs> the human heart that is not open to God's love and forgiveness and causing pain and hurt in the world. That's what is unclean. So right on the heels of this encounter, we come to today's lesson, still in Mark, and we find that Jesus has left his surroundings with the Jewish population. He's no longer surrounded by Jewish, Hebrew, Israelite, whatever you want to say, and has moved over into Gentile territory. He's gone to a city by the name of Tyre, <coughs> which is actually on the coast. And um, he is, finds himself smack dab in the middle of this uh, shipping path, this center of commerce run by Greeks and Gentiles with a very, very low Jewish population. So for many readers, today's gospel is not a very easy read because it sounds like Jesus is a little rude and dismissive. It sounds like he's being put off by someone who actually comes to him in need. Someone from the community comes to Jesus, and it sounds like he's kind of rude to them. But if we pull our lessons out of context and simply read these 13 verses on their own, <coughs> yeah, maybe we might think that. But you know, Scripture is not meant to be read in bits and pieces. It is not to be understood just in picking things out here and there. It's meant to be read as the entire inspired Word of God. And we know that Scripture interprets Scripture. And we also know 
that nothing in Scripture stands alone. That if we have one passage here, there are other passages that support or help us to understand that. So that's why it's frustrating for me when narrow-minded folks pick out a verse here or a passage there just to kind of prove their point. We call that proof texting. You know, I'm, I'm convinced that anyone can take their Bible and find something in there if they look hard enough to prove their point of view no matter what it is. So if we remember Jesus' words to the Pharisees and the scribes from last week, I want to think about what he's telling us this week. But in addition to what we heard last week, I want us to keep in mind and to view our reading from Mark through the lens of a scripture found in the book of Hebrews. It's from chapter 11, verse 1. And that verse is the first verse of what we commonly call the faith chapter in Hebrews. And that says, Now faith is confident in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. So faith is confidence in what we hope for. Confidence in what we hope for. And assurance about what we do not see. So with that verse in mind, and remembering what Jesus had said to the Pharisees and scribes last week, I invite you to hear the word of God from the 7th chapter of Mark, and we'll begin reading with the 24th verse. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs are going to take the children from. He then told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hands on him. After he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears, then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said, Ephatha, which means be open. At this, the man's ears were open, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. This is the word of God, and it can be trusted. Thanks be to God. Okay, we hear that Jesus has gone to Tyre and then on to the Decapolis. And I want us to notice first and foremost who is not there. Now Mark is very good about telling us who is around Jesus when certain things happen. Mark is all about Jesus' action. So Mark is very good about set, setting the stage. Even though it's a short book and he uses very few words to tell what's happening and he doesn't go into a lot of theological discourse, he does set the stage for us very well. He will tell us who is there. So this morning we find who is not there to be quite important. There is no mention of any Jewish leaders there because he's in Gentile territory. They're not about to defile themselves and go into unclean territory. Mix amongst the unclean people, so they put, as they call them. There are not even any religious figures there. It's just Jesus and a Syrophoenician woman. Even the disciples are not there. So it's just a room with Jesus. 
Jesus, a woman, and a loaf of bread. Quite honestly, front and center is something we need to understand when we come to Jesus. It's just us and Jesus. Okay, it doesn't matter who else is around us. The other disciples don't need to be there. The religious leaders don't need to be there. It is just us and Jesus and a loaf of bread. And we have a conversation with Jesus. What we see in our scripture reading this morning is that we find ourselves looking in on an encounter with Jesus and a Gentile. Jesus is on the other side now. He's not hanging out amongst the, the religious leaders trying to teach them any lessons. He, he's done all he can do there. He is finding himself in hostile pagan territory. He is, the, he is doing what he is doing, trying to get some rest, in an area where he thinks no one is going to bother him. And this Syrophoenician woman comes in. He is in a room with someone who by Jewish standards is ritually unclean and who they think has absolutely no place at the table. And at the center of their meeting, with Jesus on this side of the table, the Syrophoenician right here, we find a loaf of bread. We saw in John's Gospel for seven Sundays, the whole I am the bread of life passages, he says in the Gospel of John, I am the bread of life, and we see in John's Gospel that, G the, that bread is used as a symbol for Jesus' ministry here on earth. It is a sustaining, life-giving force for those who come in contact with it. We know he used bread on a hillside and fed thousands of people. He's the one who breaks bread with the outcast of society. And as the bread of life, his whole ministry has been defined by the sharing of bread with all the wrong people. When was the last time passage that said Jesus sat down at the table with the Pharisees and the scribes and broke bread? I don't remember hearing that in Scripture because they won't eat with the other Jesus sat down with all the wrong people. He sat down with the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the sick and the lame. He sat down with the people who weren't allowed in the church and broke bread. Jesus brought bread to those who could not return the favor. Jesus gave us the bread of life. And once again, Jesus, bread, and <coughs> someone who needs that bread are all we can see in our lesson for today. We read that the woman came into the room, fell at Jesus' feet, and begged Jesus to heal her daughter of an unclean spirit. And immediately Jesus tells her that his mission is to the Jews and even goes so far as to insult her heritage. You know, the, the Greeks and the Gentiles were referred to as dogs. <laughs> now, dogs in the day of Jesus were not these wonderful little pets that we have in our house today. They were scavengers. They were wild dogs. They were not domesticated. Uh, so uh, that was not a, a nice term when he said dog. You know, that doesn't sound like the Jesus that we know and love, does it? It doesn't look like the Jesus in our storybooks that we grew up with as children. The white robes and sitting there saying, suffer the little children to come unto me. That, that's, that's not the Jesus that we've been reading about. That's not the sweet Jesus that we want to see. What I think was happening here was that Jesus was simply stating the Jewish religion that the Messiah had come for the Hebrew people, but what he was doing was amplifying his message that I have come bringing inclusivity and grace for everyone. At this point, when Jesus said, I can't help you because we're not going to share our bread. We're not going to let the crumbs from the children say, well, we're going to feed the children first and let the crumbs fall to the ground. And then, you know, she could have just gotten all mad about that and left. She could have been hurt. She could have come back with a mean-spirited response. But she had some desperate faith. Her daughter needed healing. She had a desperate faith. 
She could have said, the heck with you, and left. But that's not what she does. That's not what she did because she had a desperate place. She had a need. That woman did not back down or give up. She simply responded by saying, even the crumbs from the children's table is sufficient for me. Even the crumbs from the children's table is sufficient for me. This woman knew that she had come to the master's table and she was desperate for her needs to be met. And she, this Syrophoenician Greek woman, is responsible for pushing the boundaries of God's full inclusivity to the forefront. It is the first time that we see Jesus outside of his uh, dealing with the centurion and Jairus and his daughter. It's the first time we see Jesus dealing with the Gentile. So it's this woman who was responsible for pushing the boundaries of God's inclusive love and grace to the forefront. And it is through this woman's bold faith that we come to recognize that the kingdom of God is fully present in all places. It is not just in the temple of Jerusalem, but it is in all of God's creation. And it is through the liberating power of Jesus that she comes and goes home with her needs met. It is through the Syrophoenician woman that we know that the liberating power of Jesus Christ is for everyone. It's through the example of this outsider, as she is called, that we're to consider what our faith is all about. Faith is about persistence in the face of all odds. Think about that for a minute. Faith is about persistence in the face of all odds. I'm just, I'm overjoyed, not that Amy is homesick this morning, but the fact that y'all had the faith that there was something out there that would, that would cure her. And after months and months and months of going to doctor after doctor after doctor, they finally found the doctor who said, well, this is what's wrong. It's been going on for years. And she's been to doctor after doctor after doctor, but she finally finds a doctor who knows what the problem is. And they were persistent. They said, we are not going to live like this. We're not going to live in pain. And so they continued to go to the doctor after doctor after doctor until they found the one who said, here's the answer. This woman, this Syrophoenician woman had persistence. When Jesus said, I have come for the children of Israel first, which is what he was saying, pointing out the Jewish point of view, she says, "Uh uh-uh, that is not good enough for me. I'm not leaving here without my blessing. Faith is about realizing that even the tiniest crumb of grace is not outside of her reach. She says, okay, I'm not asking for the loaf of bread. I am perfectly happy and convinced that the crumbs of that loaf of bread that are on the table, under the table, are sufficient to meet my needs. And when we, as God's creatures, God's chosen and holy generation, understand that the crumbs from the table are enough to meet our needs, we too stand up in bold faith. In the end, now her daughter was not with her. Her daughter was at home. In the end, she left Jesus' presence with the assurance that when she walked in the door, the impure spirit would not be in control of her daughter any longer. Now that's where we fall down sometimes. We pray and we pray and we pray. We ask God and we ask God and we ask other people to pray for us. And we do this and we do that. And we do all this rigmarole, this tradition, this stuff. That we don't leave going home knowing that God's will is done. 
How many times do we pray without believing? We pray like God is the fairy godmother out there waving a wand there just to meet our needs and to put those crystal slippers on our feet at midnight. We don't pray believing that God will do what God said he would do. This woman left Jesus present to the nearest crumbs from the table, knowing that when she got home, her daughter could be left. Eight years ago, we left a 6,000 square foot building in downtown Greenville and moved to a tiny little house here in Greenville. There were about ten of us then. Ten. And we prayed for leaving that God had a reason for us to be here. I have never, ever wavered in my faith that we are here for a reason. I have prayed every single day for 10 years that God would use this church to reach others for our son of Jesus Christ. Bold faith is about trusting that Jesus will do what he has promised to do. And clinging, clinging to that promise, even if it's by a thread, but clinging to the promise that we have been reconciled and restored and saved, and that God will do what God has promised to do. Bold faith is knowing that God's mercy and grace is meant for all of God's children, in spite of what any society or any religious authorities may say. Jesus continues in outsider territory in our lesson today because he goes to the Capitalist, which is ten little towns clustered around each other, full of Gentiles and Greeks and pagans. It's another bastion of <coughs> Gentile power. As the people brought their <coughs> friend to Jesus and said, our friend here can no longer hear. And he studied his speech impediment. <coughs> and Jesus comes up to this young man and he says, come away from the crowd. I'm not going to do this here in front of all these other people. I'm going to take you aside. And he does. Jesus takes him away from the crowd and he puts his fingers in his ears. And then he spits in his hand and touches the man's tongue. Now you want to talk about unclean? <laughs> Jesus came to break down the bad, the boundaries that the church had created. And that is what we are called to do if we're going to be bold in faith. We are called to stand against man-made tradition and share the fact that God's love and mercy and salvation was sent for all of us. As Jesus was healing this man, he looks up into the heavens and we're told that he sighed and he shouted, Be open. And with that, the man began to hear and the man began to speak plainly once again. Neither one of our stories, the Syrophoenician woman or the man with the speech impediment and deafness, is a clean, cheerful, or sanitized version of what Jesus is. It is not the storybook version of Jesus. It is the reality of Jesus. But you know, the kingdom of God is not all cheerful. It is for those who know what it means in their lives, but you know, the things that happen in the kingdom of God aren't always the easiest to understand. When Jesus came and brought God's kingdom with him, he came with the full intent of breaking down all of society's norms and 
bringing in this radical new equality. And here we are 2,000 years later and we still don't have it right. There's still people out there saying, you're in, but you're out. You belong, but you don't. You can come in if you do this. <clears throat> the only thing Jesus says is call on my name. Confess me as your Lord and Savior and you will be saved. Jesus has turned the world upside down and once again reminded us that he has made a way for the Jew and the Gentile, like God. Paul's words to the Galatians solidify what our faith is all about when he says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God. Through faith, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. And if you believe and if you belong to Christ Jesus, then you are Abraham's seed and you are heirs according to the promise, the promise that we just started studying in Sunday school this morning. It takes a bold faith to embrace the idea that the crumbs of grace from the master's table are sufficient for our salvation. We can't believe how easy it is to be a part of God's family. We can't believe because we humans want to make everything so complicated. So we can't believe how easy it is for Jesus Christ to come into our hearts and to save us from eternal damnation and to say, today you will be with me in paradise. Amen. As we rise from our baptismal waters, we're reminded we are all new creations in Christ Jesus. The old chains that have bound us so tightly to the law and the expectations of this world are gone. And we have all been reconciled to Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior and our Redeemer. As we rise out of those waters... Jesus takes his fingers out of our ears and off of our tongue and he says, be open. Be open. Be open. Speak the truth of our faith and love. But you know, we're not called just to speak our faith. We're called to live it out every single day. And when our faith is bold, we can't hide it. We can't hide it. People will notice the newness that our faith in Christ has brought to our lives. Jesus came with a message of radical love and inclusion for all of God's children. Our faith in this love and our place at his table calls on us to share the bread of life. And it invites us to become bolder each and every day in the faith that we have been given. That seed of faith that is planted within us that fills us. That spot that God has placed in every single human being called a soul is nurtured and grown by the faith that we have. It's that bold faith that provides the confidence we have in our salvation. And it gives us the assurance to know what lies ahead for each of us. Next weekend we are invited to cross over into that place. That outsider place. That place where <coughs> other spirits tread. We are called to go and to reach out in bold faith and touch lives. We are called to go to a place that some will declare is outside the reach of God. It is outside His power, His love, and His grace. But our mission is to be bold in our faith and to go to that place and share boldly that Jesus Christ's love is for everyone. Amen.